Uh, this is the Vital Voices Speaker Series, and what we try to do is we try to bring in people whose voices are vital, whose voices are important in the discourse of what we, we do every day, how we live. Uh, last month we had a panel on education, the top issues facing public education in Texas. Earlier in September we had a panel talk about immigration issues, which as you know is um, on the top of minds people, especially tonight, Election Eve. And this month we have Leonard Kincaid with us. And Leonard is the co-founder of the Houston Recovery Center. It's, it's an innovative model. He'll tell you a little bit more about it. I believe it was started in San, Di in San Antonio. And um, Leonard brought it here, was uh, instrumental in bringing it here to Houston, uh, a recovery center. And it's literally right down the street from us. Um, so what, what, do you th what do you think a recovery center would be? So people can find resources. Okay, people find resources. Anyone else? Support. Support. But it literally, if you are incapacitated and you have a place, you need a place to go, you literally can go right then, right now. It's open 24 hours a day. Someone had had too much to drink on a Friday night and they can't go home. They can go to the Houston Recovery Center, and they're they're taken care of for the night and possibly for longer. So Leonard, as I said, is the co-founder and executive director of the Houston Recovery Center. His experience in the field of addiction and mental health spans 30 years. He's educated in Texas and Mississippi, and he's one of those rare people that has a master's of business, an MBA, as well as a licensed professional counselor and a licensed chemical dependency counselor. That is a very rare combination. Um, Mr. Kincaid currently serves on several boards supporting individuals experiencing mental health issues and addiction and serves on several boards, uh, including the Network of Behavioral Health Providers and Crisis Intervention Houston. He's also the co-founder and co-chair of the Houston Recovery Initiative, a coalition formed in 2010 to implement a recovery-oriented system uh, of care as a model for Houston. So without further ado, Please give a warm UHD welcome to Mr. Leonard Kincaid. Good evening. First, let me apologize to you guys for getting here late. I'm a real stickler for time, and so I feel real guilty when I uh, delay getting started on time, and it's my fault. So uh, I do have an excuse. I don't know if it's acceptable. Um, but I ended up at the wrong building. I was uh, up at the top of the hill. I've done presentations on uh, uh, the University of Houston downtown campus before. And all of the other presentations that I've done has been in the other building. So naturally, my mind was set on, OK, I know how to get where I'm going. Um, so I didn't do any advanced work to make sure that I was in the right place. And then, of course, as always, this time of day around Houston, you can expect to run into some unanticipated traffic. Okay? So it took me much longer than I anticipated to park and then ended up at the wrong building. So that's my explanation. Uh, so please accept the apology. Uh, that is not something that I practice doing. I do respect your time. Uh, and so, <clears throat> again, uh, excuse my, uh, my lateness. So I want to start this conversation a little bit upstream. It's a place where, when I was in college, it would have been nice to have this information. I'm not sure how much it would have changed my behavior, but I wouldn't have had the excuse of saying that I didn't know. OK, so this conversation is, is a little bit advanced. I mean, a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit in front of the information that I want to share with you about the organization that I run. But I think this information can also give you some appreciation for the value of the work that we do, and all of us that work in this space. So um, one of my coworkers um, decided the title is Setting the Bar, a Responsible Drinking Limits. And how many of you have ever heard of the idea of responsible drinking limits? OK. Um, any idea what that means? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's, a nat, that's a real natural and common response. 
This is not a conversation that we generally have. You see, we come from a society, we come from a society that basically expect all of us to know how to drink responsibly. You know, you're just supposed to know that. I don't know how. Maybe through osmosis. You know, you're just supposed to know. Okay? You know, you're supposed to know not to get drunk. Okay? And yet there's no conversations about what does that mean? What does that mean to drink responsible? And so that's where we want to start this conversation. And the first thing I want to share with you is this that's from our own chronicle. And it talks about why this is so, so incredibly important. Uh, and it says, driving impaired by booze or drugs are dying and killing in the Houston area at a, at a staggering rate. An epidemic unchecked by police, prosecutors, a public awareness campaign. The nine county region around um, uh, the greater Houston area account for more fatality crashes in the last 16 years than any other major metropolitan city in the United States in the United States. So in short, what this means is that Houston enjoys the reputation of being a city with the highest rate of fatalities while driving under the influence in the United States. Now let that settle in for a minute. So as you're driving around Houston on a daily basis, there's a very good possibility that somebody on the road with you is, is driving impaired. So this is just something we want to be conscious of. And I think the more we're conscious of this, the more we're aware of this, the more we can take some responsibility when, when the opportunity presents itself to call it to people's attention, to drink responsibly. Now let's get into what that means. So when we think about alcohol, we think about um, how much alcohol is in a beer, how much alcohol is in a, um, a glass of malt liquor, how much alcohol is in a glass of wine. How much alcohol is in a, a shot glass of, of um, spirit, uh, of whiskey? Um, and so you can see the concentrations there. I'm not going to get into it. There's some information further on in the presentation that I want you to pay more attention to. Okay, again, we're talking about uh, what containers uh, hold in terms of the amount of alcohol per volume uh, in these various different drinks. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. You can look at it for yourself and kind of see what the concentration is. Um, <clears throat> I want to get to this, and then there's another slide coming up that's even more important than this. But this get down to when we're talking about responsible drinking, what are we actually talking about in terms of the amount that we can safely consume? Okay, it's a, um, on any single day, um, men can drink um, no more than four drinks a day. Women, no more than three drinks a day. In the course of a week, um, men should drink no more than 14 drinks, and women should drink no more than seven. Okay. Do you know anybody that drink more than that? I'm not talking about any of you in the room. I'm just talking about in general. You know. Do you know anybody that drink more than that? Yeah. Yeah, most of us do. People who drink, we drink more than that. Most of us do. But we haven't had any conversations about where do you get to, the, you know, where's, what's safe and what begins to put you in the danger zone. So this will give you a little bit better picture of that. Okay? Let's look at a 100-pound uh, individual. What it says is that um, in one hour, 100-pound individual, if they drink more than two drinks, or if they drink two drinks in an hour, then there's a very good chance that their alcohol, the blood alcohol concentration level is going to be 0.08. What is 0.08? The legal limit for being classified as publicly intoxicated. Okay. Let's get a little bit heavier. Let's say a person that weighs 120 pounds, okay? Um, if they drink over three drinks in an hour, they're well over the legal, the legal limits. We're talking about three beers, three glasses of wine, or three shot glasses of your favorite beverage, okay? Let's look at the people that, um, that is a little, he little bit heavier than that. Let's look at those individuals that um, say 140 pounds. So, if you weigh 140 pounds and you drink three drinks or more in an hour, you're likely to be at 0.08. So you can see there is a correlation between weight and the amount of alcohol you can consume in an hour. Okay, there is a direct relationship there. But 
I don't think that most of us ever take into consideration when we are drinking beer at a, let's say, a tailgate party. Uh, um, you've got your friends over watching uh, the football game, whether it's the Cougars or, uh, 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 you know, a few years ago when the Cougars was off to what, they started the year at $5 and um, Well, uh, the Southern Center was a very popular place for, uh, for, for U, of, U of H campus uh, cops. Um, we got to be really good friends. That year, what was that, three years ago? They started the season 5-0? and Yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, you know, and young people, I remember when I was in college, I had no idea about limits. And, and so, um, you know, I was quite often in the red zone um, uh, during, during those days, but had no idea that I was putting myself at that kind of risk. And I dare say that that is true for most young people who are in school. You don't have any sense. Nobody orientated you to this. And so you don't have any way of judging uh, what the limit are from, you know, what's safe to drink to what will put you in serious, serious trouble. And then what happens most of the time when you leave a tailgate party? What do you do? You do what? You drive. You drive home. Okay? Now, and... Uh, um, what, in, a, in an hour or two hours? How much beer might you drink? Um, and I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the friends that you have that you know that go to these tailgate parties. How much, how much might they drink? Four? Six? Yeah. Yeah. So now can you see how easy it is to be very, very intoxicated in terms of the blood alcohol level? In a relatively short period of time, we're talking about two or three hours. You know, a relatively short period of time. And now you're going to get behind the wheel and you're going to drive home. It happens every day. Or you're leaving a bar on a Friday night. Or Saturday night. So, you can easily see why we end up with so many intoxicated people on our streets. Every day. But it is largely because we're simply not aware that that, what we think is a small amount of alcohol, can impair you to this degree or can have you uh, legally classified as publicly intoxicated. Okay, okay, so enough of that. Uh, here's a little bit more information about this, and this is something that you might be interested in knowing too. And that is that, let's start at the bottom. About 35% of the population don't drink. Okay, can you believe that? Do you know anybody that don't drink? Okay, yeah, a lot of people in the room know people that don't drink. Okay, about 37% of the population drink responsibly. I mean, they never get themselves past that, that legal limit that would, call, that would end up uh, qualifying them as being uh, uh, legally intoxicated. It's about 19% that drink over the limit every day and every week. And it's about 9% that are really high-risky drinkers. That's really a small portion of the overall population, but that population is probably the population that is responsible for the most fatalities while driving under the influence. And so here again is uh, some questions that you can answer for yourself. Now, I don't want you to answer these questions for me. I just want you to read the questions and answer them for yourself. And then you can do the math at the end of it. You know, for men, do you drink more than four drinks a day? A yes or no, it's a simple answer. Women, do you drink more than three drinks a day? Simple yes or no. Uh, and what is the average number of drinks you do a week? And um, what is the average number of days a week that you, that you drink? And you can multiply that and you'll get the average number of drinks that you have in a week. So this is just for your own awareness. You don't need to share this information with me. You don't need to share information with anybody if you don't want to. But it's good information to have. And it's an, it's a, it provides you the information to have a conversation with people that's in your life that may be putting themselves at risk. Because every time they put themselves at risk, especially if they put themselves at risk and get behind the wheel, they put others at risk as well. So just be aware of that. If you want more information on this, on this uh, subject, on this specific data that I share with you, you can find it at this website. So I'll give you a minute to write it down if you like. So with that said, I'd like to talk to you a bit about the Houston Recovery Center. That's the organization that I was really invited here to tell you about the organization that I am pleased to be the co-founder of, um, an organization that we started five years ago. I actually started working on this in 2010 when I was visiting San Antonio. We were up 
at San Antonio to see that Haven for Hope project. Have you heard of it? Okay, Haven for Hope is a masterpiece of a project. It's a project that was built for homeless individuals and it takes up a couple of industrial parks. Um, it is huge, it was a $100 million undertaking. It was largely funded by Valero Oil and uh, Bear County and the city of, of San Antonio. Um, and they house over a thousand homeless people on this campus. And they have all of the resources that they, you could imagine them needing, including medical care, dental care, um, uh, uh, eye, eyeglasses, and a multitude of service providers that are there to assist them, all under one roof. So it's a masterpiece of a project. But I was most impressed by one of the other programs that showed us while we were on our campus, and that is the recovery center. It's called the Restoration Center. And what I witnessed there, um, after being in the field for over 30 years, was something that was new to me as a professional in this field. And that was that what they were doing with individuals that was being arrested for public intoxication. What I saw was in lieu of taking those individuals to jail, they was turning them over to this facility that watched over them and kept them safe until they were sober enough to be on their own. You see, public intoxication is a Class C misdemeanor. And under the law, you can be turned over to a responsible adult. You don't have to go to jail. Now, public intoxication is different from DWI. DWI is a Class B misdemeanor, and you get to go to jail. So you don't want to be caught driving under the influence. But as long as you're just walking, um, you can get a Class C. You can get transported to a facility like ours, and you don't get a ticket. So you don't have anything going on in your record because you didn't get arrested. You don't uh, have a, a fine to pay. You don't have a court date. That's a free get out of jail card. So this is what I witnessed while I was there. So I talked to everybody that I could get in front of when I got back to Houston about why Houston doing this. And San Antonio is doing this. I mean, San Antonio is smaller than us. And, um, you know, they may be doing a lot of creative things, but Houston, you're not supposed to be out in front of Houston like that with something as simple as this. And so the city agreed um, that it was um, a very small investment to make to get the kind of potential returns that was available by providing an organization like this. So inside of three years from the time I started the conversation, we actually opened our building. We started the conversation in 2010, we opened for service in 2013. So, and we got a pretty big project. So that's pretty fast speed to put something like this through the city legislative process. We got it approved by the mayor, we got it approved by city council. Uh, they fund us 100% and they set us up in operation. And this is what they set us up for. To divert individuals from jail, to reduce the jail population for people with public intoxication, uh, to preserve law enforcement resources, medical resources, and to provide those individuals with addiction issues to escape the revolving door of going in and out of jail, which is what we set out to do. Here's a snapshot of the population that we have served. Since we opened our doors in April of 2013, we've had over 34,000 uh, admission, admissions come through our center. 21,000 of those were unique, which means that we only counted them once. What this represents for the overall population of individuals going to jail for public intoxication is a 94% reduction. This is what the raw numbers look like. We get this data from the jail. When we started working on this in 2010, they were arresting 20,000 people a year for public intoxication. As you can see, between 2010 and 2012, the numbers were trending down. They went down by, uh, what is that, a little, uh, in the neighborhood of 5,000 over the three-year period. But when we came on board in April of, uh, May of 2013, we dropped it from 15,000 a year before to 6,000 during that year. Then we improved on that in 2014, approved again in 2015, again in 2016, and again in 2017. We actually didn't think we could improve on 2016, but we did. Now we get this data from the jail. This is not our data, this is theirs. They're, this is a report that they give us to tell us how many people they arrested for public intoxication. And remember, public intoxication, again, is a Class C misdemeanor. So they have the option of taking the person to jail. It's primarily about safety or turning them over to a responsible adult. They created us to be that responsible adult. And this is the return that we're giving the city on that investment. In 2018, we're actually on track. If you look at the numbers between 2017 and 2018, that we're still uh, driving the trend down. On the path that we're on right now, if we can continue this throughout the year, uh, then we'll improve on the numbers that we had last year in terms of individuals going to jail. That means we'll have more people, less people going to jail. This year, if we can, if we can maintain the, 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 the process, the path that we have right now, um, 
uh, we will improve on that number, which means that we'll have less than 800 people going to jail this year for public intoxication. Now, what this has created for us is this huge opportunity. Let me talk a little bit about that. Okay, so what this basically means is that 91% of the population coming through our center uh, come through the center once or twice. That means that about 9% of that population are repeat visitors. They make up about 96% of our total admissions. And this is a snapshot of what that looks like over the 13-year period. Um, in our facility, uh, the first year we opened, we had about 37,000 come through our facility, uh, 58 the next year, 63 the next year, 66 in 2016, 60 in 2017. You see, we're having a, a, a little bit of a trend down here. And then that, so far this year, we've had 5,400 people come through our facility. Um, <clears throat> now, we opened, when we first opened, we were open just to serve law enforcement, primarily HPD. But now we have opened the facility up to serve all law enforcement in the greater Houston area. There's about 30 or more law enforcement jurisdictions in the greater Houston area, and we serve them all, including the Metro, the Sheriff Department, the Constable's Department, the University of Houston, uh, and a number of others. Uh, <clears throat> we are, we've also started opening ourselves up to other places that we can identify this population that's at risk for substance use, for heavy substance use, and being um, and then coming to the attention of law enforcement as a result of that. So we, we have a number of people now because of the history that we have on the streets of Houston, a number of people, especially from the homeless population, that walk up to our facility on a daily basis and ask for admission. Now, oftentimes those individuals have been through our facility before, but they said no. But we invited them to come back when they changed their mind or if they changed their mind. And now we have a steady stream of people coming back saying, I changed my mind. Uh, does that offer you may still hold? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, as I mentioned, we receive law enforcement. We, we receive uh, diversions from law enforcement all over the city. This is just a short list of them. And as you can see here, uh, uh, Houston Police Department still make up, the, uh, make up for the largest number of individuals that are admitted to our facility. Uh, I mentioned walk-ins. We, we developed a program service model that I'll talk about a little bit more later. But the model is, is attracting so much attention that other others, providers are actually asking for access to our service model. An example of that is uh, the drug court. Uh, this particular drug court is called the Reintegration Court. They have contracted with us to get access for our services because a number of the people that come before the judge in the Reintegration Court is there on drug charges. Okay, and the, the offenses are low enough for it not to be a felony and they feel safe they can let these people out uh, and refer them to services that will address their, their drug usage. Okay, in addition to the reintegration court, um, the uh, adult probation saw what we were doing with the reintegration court and decided that they wanted access to our services too. So they have also contracted with us to get access to, and we're doing a pilot with them, where we are providing uh, access to our recovery program in a couple of their sites. They have already, we've been in their sites for about four months now. They have already asked if, if, we, if we can scale that project up, mean they want more of our staff and more of their sites. Um, we're also working with hospitals um, and EMS because we know that these are places where people with addiction issues often show up before they start looking for help. And if we can get access to them while they're in those, those particular points, then we may be able to direct them out of that facility, taking advantage of that opportunity to intervene on them into our care. We also work inside of Harris County Jail because we know that a lot of the people that are in jail are in jail because of their substance issues or their substance and mental health issues. And, uh, and they're going to leave jail without any support, which means that they're not likely to change their behavior, which means they're likely to go back to jail again. So we can catch them while we're in jail, connect with them, and then direct them to our recovery services. Uh, there's a chance that we can give them a pathway out of their addiction issues. Uh, which is what we would truly like to do. We've actually started a street outreach activity too. Actually, we do two street outreach projects. The goal here is that a vast number of those individuals that cycle through that 9% that come through repeatedly are homeless individuals. I'll show you some more data on that in a minute. But what we're after is they say no when they come through the facility, but we make contact with them, so they now kind of know who we are. So we've got a street outreach team where we've got an individual that go out on the street 
into these encampments, looking for these individuals that have addiction issues, and then offering them the opportunity to come back to the service center if they've changed their mind. Okay, we've been very successful in getting a lot of those individuals housed uh, through the homeless outreach uh, strategy and the, uh, the Coalition for the Homeless uh, Services for that population. We also work with five other organizations that have street outreach workers working uh, the streets of downtown, working all these encampments that you see. Believe it or not, those people that you see under the bridges and on the streets um, are not there because they are not there because they don't have another option. Oftentimes they're there because they're refusing to accept any help that's been offered to them. Okay, there, there is a whole small army of people out there engaging with them on a regular basis, trying to give them additional options. And we have a staff out there in that group. We also have a van that drives around in the downtown area. We call it our public intoxicant transport van that's looking for those individuals that are impaired. You may have, had, you may have heard about the drug Kush. How many of you heard about the drug Kush? Okay, yes. Okay, about a year ago, that drug caused a really big issue in Houston where we had, I think, what is 15 or 16 people end up going to the emergency room because of a bad batch of that drug that hit the street. Okay, so following that incident, we put a van on the street that actually drives around uh, looking for individuals that are impaired and then intervene on those individuals to see if they can get them to come to the sobering center. And they have fairly good success in talking individuals into coming over. Um, our goal is to get them to get help uh, rather than to continue that behavior. Uh, that project is actually supported by the Downtown Business Development District and Midtown Development District because uh, those are areas that are hard hit by, uh, by this population on the streets of Houston. So the, the primary drug that we see coming through the Southern Center continue to be alcohol. And I think you can see now why I spent so much time on the front end calling your attention to uh, the, 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 the effects of uh, alcohol consumption. So alcohol is uh, by far the leader, uh, followed by marijuana, followed by uh, synthetic cannabinoids, um, followed by cocaine. Cocaine is beginning, is beginning to have a comeback, a real serious comeback. Um, smoking cocaine seems to be really popular among young people. Um, and, uh, and a host of other drugs, all the other drugs that you uh, can just imagine. Uh, we've got a whole list of them here. What we are not seeing yet, but I say yet, and I say it with, uh, with a lot of emphasis on that yet, uh, what we're not seeing yet is the, the explosion of use of opioids across our community like we're seeing in other parts of the country, okay? Law enforcement says there are a couple of reasons for that. Okay, now we lag San Antonio, we lag Dallas, and the use of opioids, especially heroin, in our community. Okay, but law enforcement says one of the primary reasons that we lag behind these other communities is not because the drugs are not coming through Houston, uh, because they are, largely because of our ship channel, but because the, the people who, who that is their industry have not set up the distribution channels to get the drugs into a pipeline and out on the street. As, uh, uh, when you listen to law enforcement talk about the distribution uh, uh, process, it's really, really sophisticated. Okay, they have to set up a whole, in, they have to set up a whole infrastructure for the business before they can actually put a, a significant uh, uh, amount of product on the street where it begin to return the investment, on the investment. So uh, we should not relax. We should not get too comfortable in thinking that we will not experience what um, uh, West Virginia is experiencing, what Ohio is, is experiencing, what Kentucky is experiencing. Um, um, what is that other state uh, that's experiencing? Um, a huge, huge explosion in opioid use. Um, that's really devastating communities. And so um, just as, um, what is that, two weeks ago, we had this crisis, this really tragic incident that occurred um, by this football, with this football player from Rice University. Um, did you guys hear about that? Okay, so it's an indication. Um, he overdosed because a friend gave him a pill that, he, that the friend thought was uh, one, one kind of drug and it turned out to be another. And EOD. 
So, uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's in our community. It's in our community already. It's just not as prevalent as we are afraid, we are afraid that it is going to be and in, the, and in the near future. So just be aware. Uh, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> so what we've identified is about 1,870 individuals that are frequent users of our center. They make up about 36% of our total admissions. So we've developed a program that targets that population. Now, when you look at the population that's flowing through the Sobering Center, about 73% of the population that flow through the Sobering Center are professional people. About 27% of that population is homeless. If you move over to our recovery program, you'll see that only 24% of that population have a resident to go to. 76% of that population is homeless. This is the population that I was referring to about that 1,800 that make up the vast majority of the individuals that are cycling through our center. And this is the population that we did out the whole program to intervene on. So a little bit more about that population is this is what they present with. Uh, so as you can see here, these individuals have a multitude of challenges. 100% of them have an addiction issue. 84% uh, has a mental health diagnosis. 76% of that population is homeless. 73% have a criminal history. And about 47% of that population are frequent users of the emergency center. Okay, all of these are publicly supported services. These are taxpayers' dollars paying for these services. So anytime you can stabilize one of these individuals, you give the community a huge return on the investment. Okay, uh, so what we did was we, we created a program that we call, um, uh, in general, redefining the recovery journey. And so here's kind of how that works. We started out what, with um, defining our core values, getting really, really solid about that. What is it that we are after? What are we trying to achieve? Uh, why do we want to do it this way? And what does it mean? And, and so we chose the hearts as our symbol for doing this work uh, because we think that what's really necessary to influence behavior change, especially with a population like this, is that they know you care. That they know you care. They have absolutely no doubt that you care. Because one of the things that is happening with, with this population is a lot of these individuals have lost faith in themselves. They don't really think they can change. They've lost faith in others. They don't think anybody else cares. And so they have just kind of resided that this is my fate in life. And so just offering them help once or twice does not necessarily mean that they're going to take advantage of it. Because one, they don't believe they can, and two, they don't believe you care. And so it was important for us to, un to create this, this, in this environment, this atmosphere, in our environment. If you come to our environment, what we want you to feel is that you're in a place where care exists. We do it through our compassion, our dignity, and our respect for everybody that comes through our door. Whether you came out of River Oaks or whether you, and, the, and we do, we get people from all walks of life through our facility. Um, and we treat everybody who comes through the facility with the highest degree of um, uh, confidentiality. Um, we do not share information with anybody, including law enforcement, or who's in our center. Uh, unless that information is released by, is, we give them permission to do that by the, the class themselves unless it's a circumstance where we can't afford to keep the identity, like some kind of major crime has been committed or that, or that kind of thing. But uh, whether you came out of River Oaks or whether you're in the same clothes that you've been in for the last month, okay, everybody who comes through our center get treated the same. And, and that is with compassion, dignity, and respect. That's the foundation of being able to cause change, to facilitate behavior change. And it provides us a place to stand to have some really hard conversations. I mean, we can be very honest with these people about where they are. But, the other thing that we can also do is, and we do this out of, our, out of how we staff. Almost all of the individuals who operate the Sovereign Center have lived experience. They have gone through a state certification program that qualified them to work in this role. They're called peer specialists, uh, recovery coaches. Okay, so when they're talking to somebody, they can have that compassion, uh, but they can talk to them with a degree of credibility because they've actually walked in their shoes. Okay, it's quite different from me. I'm a clinician. I got a lot of training. I know a lot about facilitating behavior change. I know a lot about facilitating the conversation that leads to behavior change. I have not walked in those shoes. So that's the degree of authenticity that's missing from my conversation, irregardless of how much compassion I have. Okay, and we see the difference in, in, uh, in the interaction between uh, a peer specialist with one of these clients and a clinician like myself uh, every day. So, these hearts is the foundation of our work. And here's just a, a little bit more about what they stand for uh, as far as we're concerned. 
It's hard to know that change is possible, that addiction doesn't define anyone, and that recovery is a slow process. That recovery is a slow process. That's one of the things that we have to be grounded in, because this is a population that process can be very, very, very slow. One of the individuals that we've had the greatest amount of success with, which was one of our biggest users of resources in terms of uh, admissions out of facility, trips to the jail, transports by EMS, trips to the emergency room. One of the biggest users that was in our uh, uh, service system enrolled in our program, but it took us four years to have sustained behavior change. We would get small episodes of change, but as soon as this person, as soon as we thought they were at a place where they were safe to kind of reintegrate back into the community uh, with less structure, they would, they would spiral back out of control. And it took us four years to get sustained behavior change. But the last year of this person's life has been really, really rewarding, sufficiently enough to us to feel like it was worth all of the effort that we put into it because of the amount of change that we've realized over the last year. Okay, I don't think this person's been to jail once in the last year. This person was going to jail every other week. Um, this person was, going, was getting three or four transports by EMS to the emergency room every month. Okay, this is for like four years. This is the four years, I don't know how long he'd been doing it before we got in his life, but this was for the first four years we was, we was, we was in this individual's life. An EMS transport is about $900 per trip. And this guy was doing this three or four times. He was using EM, EMS like Uber. So, <clears throat> Uh, he has not had a uh, uh, EMS, I don't think he's been in the hospital, but uh, maybe once in the whole, in the last year. Okay, and so we're not looking for absent, complete abstinence. We're using a harm reduction model. We will take anything we can get in terms of improved behavior change. And so we think that the work that we've done here has been greatly rewarded. Um, and, and, but we continue to work with him. He's still in our program. And we're hoping that one day he'll be absolutely, completely drug free. He's not there yet. This is five years that we've been working with him. Uh, <clears throat> to hard to offer second, uh, uh, second and third chances and even fourth chances and more um, because again this guy was with us uh, for four years before we saw sustained behavior change. So what well, we operate as a proactive service model. This opportunity is afforded us because of the relationship that we have with all these first responders. Our service philosophy that is, is that addiction is a disease, a chronic disease just like any other chronic disease, like asthma, like diabetes, it has to be managed. It is not curable, but it can be successfully managed. That recovery is a lifelong journey. It is not a destination. You do not go through an episode of treatment and then you're cured, okay? You may go through seven episodes of treatment and you're still not cured. Um, it is a lifelong journey. You have to work for recovery every day. Now, get easier over time. You've got people that are living very successful, very productive lives that are living in recovery. A lot of them. A lot of them. You'd never know they were in recovery unless they chose to share. They're doing just fine. That's because they're managing it. They're not leaving it alone and letting it take care of itself. They're managing it. Okay? And that treatment is a step in that journey. Quite often we think that if once you go through treatment, then you fix the problem. Quite often, especially the community and the family think that, okay, you went, to, you went to a treatment facility, you got fixed, so now you're fine. Okay, so now come on back and you can be the person that you used to be, not the new person you're trying to be, so have a beer. So, uh, and then not knowing that, no, you can't do that. You can't return to the old lifestyle. Oftentimes, you can't even return to places that you used to hang out because all those are triggers. You can't listen to the music that you used to enjoy quite often until you get a significant amount of recovery under your belt because it'll all trigger you. It'll bring that, that craving right back, and it's uncontrollable. So um, uh, back to our uh, model. What we've created is this proactive intervention service model. And we've been able to do this because of the unique relationship we have with all of these first responders. You see, what make our uh, service model proactive as compared to other providers who work in this space is that we look for people that are not looking for help. We get those individuals brought in front of us because of our relationship with law enforcement, primarily. Other providers who work in this space run reactive service models. And the difference is they wait for people to show up at their door and say, I'm looking for help. Okay, that's most of the people who work with addiction. What's unique about what we do is that law enforcement 
catch these people while they're active in their behavior, bring them to us, and we offer them help. This is the same with the jail. We catch these people while they're in jail, uh, and we intervene on them while they're in jail. They're not looking for help in jail, but they're in jail because of their addiction issue, and we get a chance to intervene on them. We do the same thing with the courts. Um, we're beginning to do this in the community, on the streets, uh, and we're hoping to move this to hospitals where when an individual is in the hospital because of a crisis related to drug usage, whether it's an overdose or a prolonged drug usage, that we get a chance to intervene on them while they're there to offer them the opportunity to find a pathway out of that behavior. What our, eight, what our recovery program consists of is 18 months uh, of support. It's six months of intensive case management and 18 months of peer support. The case management is provided by a licensed clinician the peer support is provided by a person in recovery, a person with lived experience. This person is certified by the state uh, to work in that role. And so what we do is we'll find a person, we'll determine what level of severity that they're experiencing, and then we'll match them with a service that's appropriate for that level of severity. If they need addiction, if they need detox, then we'll put them in a detox facility. If they need residential care, we can place them in a residential facility. If they can use a less structured environment with a less, with a less amount of therapeutic intervention, then we will put them in a lower level of, of care. But our goal is to get them in a safe, supportive, recovery-friendly environment. Uh, and so they can begin to do their recovery work. Now, wherever they are, as I said earlier, they are our client. So when we place them in these facilities, the facility know that this is our client. We want you to do what you do, whether it's detox or residential, uh, but we want access to this client while he's in your care because you're going to have him for, if it's detox, five to seven days. If it's residential, 45 to 90 days. He's in our program for a year and a half. So we want access to them while they're in your care. We're not going to mess with your treatment methodologies, but we want access. We want to see this client every day if we choose to because that's what our care plan um, call for. Uh, we see them as often as we think is necessary. Our primary goal is to make sure that they complete that level of care so they're ready to take advantage of the next level of care. Quite often what happens when these individuals go through the first level of care, they start feeling better. And so they kind of forget that uh, it was really bad when I got here. And so that they say, well, I tell you what, I'm feeling better, so I think I'll just uh, not go to that next level of care, and I thank you for the contribution that you made, and I'll take it from here. Okay? And what you see in that population is that well over half of them relapse within the first 90 days. Within the first 90 days. What we realize about and this is what the research says. To give a person the very best chance of sustaining long-term recovery is that you need to keep them engaged in a, a, a consistently engaged in a recovery program for up to three years, three to five years, depending on the severity of the problem and the kind of drug that they're addiction to, and addicted to. If you can do that, if you can do it three to five years, then there's an 80% chance that they'll be able to achieve long-term recovery. 80%. That's not, still not 100%. This is not math and it's still not 100%, that means that you're still likely to lose two out of 10 to a relapse, even if you can keep them engaged for that period of time. That's how baffling this, this drug is, that this addiction is, this disease is. It's not easy to overcome, but it can be overcame. People do it every day. But this is what we do. We manage them across all of these different services to make sure that they get all the support they need to be in a position to be able to pursue long-term recovery. And then we'll support them past the 18 months if they choose to stay engaged. But we think that if they stay with us in 18 months, we'll get a foundation under them sufficient for them to be able to navigate the community pretty much on their own without being at as much risk as they would be had they not had that level of investment in them. So um, as a result of that service model, these are the kind of programs that we've been able to attract, starting with um, the public and toxic transport van. Well, first of all, the sovereign center itself um, the place where we receive people and sober them up and release them to the community is funded, is funded by the city of Houston, 100%. The public intoxication van is supported by the Downtown Business Development District and Midtown. They saw the value of our work on the streets uh, sufficient to uh, be willing to invest in maintaining those services on the street. We used to run that van eight hours a day, five days a week. Uh, they asked us to move it to seven days a week. So now we run it eight hours a day, five days a week, and uh, 10 hours a day, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, so they feel pretty good about the work that we're doing. The 18-month program was created out of some special funds that we received through the City of Houston Health Department. It was out of a waiver that was given to the state called the 1115. 
excuse me, we didn't qualify for these funds uh, directly from the state, uh, but because of our relationship with the City of Houston Health Department and their appreciation for the work that we're doing, uh, they decided to, fund, to pick us up as a project and fund us. Okay, um, that is about an $800,000 a year project. Uh, we have also been funded for our street outreach work by Baxter Foundation. Um, the reintegration court is funded by Harris County. Um, the adult probation is, is funded by Harris County also. And now we're doing a pilot project with um, the University of Texas School of Public Health. It's a SAMHSA funded project called HEROES where um, we are working directly with EMS targeting individuals that EMS transport to the hospital that OD on, on opioids, okay? And so the way this project work is that an EMS, which is paired with one of our recovery support specialists, and this individual's lived experiences in uh, opioid addiction, uh, go to the home of the individuals that OD uh, with the, 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 the peer specialist and the EMS uh, person, a paramedic, go to the home of the person that OD after they get out of the hospital to have a conversation with them about how they ended up in that situation in the first place and are they willing to accept help. And if they do, then we'll get them into a program. Okay? They have had so much success with that project already. The, the goal of the project for the first year was 50 people. They had done 50 people in the first four months. So they moved the goal from 50 to 150 for the first year. And now they're asking us if they can scale that project, which means they want to add, they want to add new teams to target that population. So in our 18-month program, uh, we have already enrolled 1, 000, over 1,000 people. Um, 945 of those individuals have been referred to a safe facility where they can do their recovery work. Uh, 796 individuals participate in our recovery coaching program. These are people that have lived experience that are talking to them on a regular basis. Um, 90, uh, as, of the, uh, as of October 20, 90 of these individuals was on our case management um, uh, program and receiving coaching. And we had 49 at that time in active treatment, where there was residential treatment or detox. And this is what that population profile looks like. Again, 100% have a mental health issue, and this is in our program. 80% um, are homeless, 84% have a criminal have a mental health, have a criminal history, 88% have a mental health diagnosis, and 53% are frequent users of emergency rooms. This is another way of looking at the program that I just got through describing, the 18-month program. Um, and basically what we do is manage these individuals across all these different uh, services that you see here. Um, whether it's detox or residential, uh, shelter included. And all these shelters are recovery friendly shelters. They're just not uh, a roof uh, and a bed and, and a, a hot meal. Uh, they do recovery work in these facilities. Those are the only facilities we, re we will refer them to. Um, one of the other things that we realized about this population that we served, you know, we talked about all these different service sites that these individuals show up in. So we started questioning what would be the benefit of us being in communication with these providers that these individuals are showing up in? If we're all seeing the same people, why shouldn't we be talking to each other about the care of these individuals? Because we all have a goal. Quite often the goal is the same. Or quite often the goals overlap or the goals could support each other. But we're not talking to each other. Oftentimes what you see with this population is that they may have five case managers, okay, because they got a case manager for this issue and a case manager, so like the, the, the individual with addiction and, and, uh, and mental health. So they got a case manager for addiction. They got a case manager for mental health. They're homeless, so they got a case manager for homeless. Um, they may have a, a, a couple of other case managers in their lives. And so all these people are working to achieve specific goals with this individual, but the plan that they all the, the, you know, the five of them is not coordinated. And so we begin to question that and ask, why is that the case? Why aren't we coordinated? Why can't we leverage each other? Why can't we create a unified plan so all of us are working at the same goal, so that my work support your work and your work support the other person's work that's trying to improve the quality of this individual's life? So we set out to train that. We, start, we started working on this about four years ago. And we did an analysis on about, was it 1,800 of our clients? And this is what we found. We found them in EMS system, um, 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 
the Harris Health System, um, HMIS, which is the Coalition for the Homeless System, uh, HPD, and the jail. These individuals were showing up in all these, uh, in all these areas. This is what a snapshot of one of our clients looked like when we started analyzing this data. Uh, eight, out of 1,800 clients, they represented 9,619 EMS transports. Again, an EMS transport costs about $900 a transport. Okay, so, so you can do the math. We get into some real numbers real quick here. Uh, we found about 4,000 of them in the Harris Health System. We found 1,400 of them. This is 1,100. This was in one year. And this is just a snapshot of the data. This is not the whole, this is not the whole thing. This is just a snapshot. Um, 1,100 incidents have been um, 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 in a, in, involved with uh, HPD in a year. Uh, 1,300 admissions to jail. And in EMS, I mean, in the, uh, the uh, Homeless uh, Information Management System, we, we found 108,000 contacts with the EMS, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Coalition Homeless uh, Information Management System. And so basically what this represents is a lot of public supported services. So the degree that we can stabilize this population, we return a ton of money to taxpayers. Um, and that, you don't get to put that money in your pocket. You just get to get, it just get to get used more efficiently and more effectively. Okay. <clears throat> so what have we learned out of this little experience in this short period of time? We've learned that um, the Sovereign Center is an effective community intervention for active substance use. We see this every day. We learned that a costly population recover with access to services and proper support. We learned that client care coordination is important for clients uh, with high service utilization who do stabilize given time. We've seen it repeatedly. We learned that complexity of stabilizing behavior health requires a coordinated system of care, which is something that is grossly lacking across our community. I think the greatest place to take some of the inefficiencies out of our system is that we, created, we create these coordinated care plans where everybody that's serving a client with a multitude of issues must be in communication, in communication with each other and coordinating the care plan. What we also learned is that we can only do this together to get the kind of accomplishments that I know is possible. We can only do it if we do it together. What I also know is about the power of compassionate work. We do believe that it is real, that change happens in the heart. Thank you. Anticipating the opioid crisis that will probably come, what are you and all of the coordinated care services doing to, to um, get ready for that? Yes. So we are actually beginning to meet as a group and talk about what are the strategies that we can do together to uh, do a better job of being more prepared for responding to this population. Uh, we are currently talking to EMS the head of EMS, as a matter of fact, there's a meeting planned uh, next week with uh, the uh, medical director for EMS. Uh, we will also have a, uh, a group of individuals from the jail that run the behavior health unit that actually is responsible for dealing with addiction, overdose and addiction, uh, people that's going through withdrawal, and people that are just on addiction inside of the county jail right now. There's a large population of individuals inside of the jail that have addiction issues. And there is a large program effort inside of the jail to serve those individuals while they're in jail. The, the issue with the prog program that's in jail is that once they leave jail, they, they, uh, uh, they don't ordinarily get connected to other resources. That's why we're there. We're there to establish the link with them while they're in jail. So when they come out, they come out into a, or, into a service into an organization with a service plan that got created while they were in jail. We are also talking to um, <clears throat> the state of Texas about supporting us 
in a collaboration uh, to begin to get access to money that will allow us to put our plan in place. So, um, yeah, there is a considerable amount of effort going into uh, getting ready for this. We're also talking to um, the hospitals, particularly the University of Houston School of Public Health, um, uh, the Bella College, of, Bella College of Medicine, and there's one other player that's in this conversation with us. And I'm trying to blank on that name. I'll probably think of it as soon as I stop talking. <coughs> Who pays, for, who pays for all this? So I, you, you talked about the recovery center model and mm -hmm. residential care and all that kind of stuff. So if a mm -hmm. person comes in off the street and they go to your center, then they get sent down the path yes. how, and they don't have the money, who yes. pays for that? Yes, and that is the case for most of the people that we see. They do not have funds to pay for the services themselves. So we're often looking for public supported services. Okay, but what we do is we use every resource across the community that we think can respond to this population. And we use both traditional and non-traditional resources. A lot of the providers who work in this space rely on traditional resources, but there are a lot of non-traditional resources across our community. Specifically, a lot of the shelters, like Salvation Army, Open Door Mission, the Reed Center, which used to be called the Men's Center, um, all of those are providers that run pretty solid recovery programs. But most of those programs are <coughs> peer-based. Okay, so they're not ran by clinicians and um, uh, licensed individuals, and they don't, um, they don't get contracts with the state, or they don't bill third-party payers. Um, they rely on contributions uh, from uh, whoever support their mission uh, to support them, like Salvation Army. is large, largely supported by the faith community. Um, uh, Open Door Mission is the same thing, largely supported by the faith community. And so those organizations are fantastic in terms of being a part of the safety net for this vulnerable population. Yes? Are those individuals who have family members, yeah. um, are, do you all involve the family in any of your recovery efforts? Is that um, the truth is not as much as we should. Um, we simply don't have the bandwidth to do that yet. Um, the, but it is absolutely critical that that be a part of any, rec any recovery plan. Uh, the goal should be, when possible, to get them reintegrated into their community and get them reintegrated with their family. Uh, but it's also equally important that you educate the family on what recovery is really all about. Because quite, quite often, families get pulled into a role of enabling without knowing that they are doing more harm than good. It's not the intent. They don't intend to, they don't, they don't intend to harm. They just don't know any better. They don't know that this person can't be that person that they used to be. They can't do the things that they used to do. You know? And so they don't know how to basically protect this person's uh, recovery. And so quite often, uh, not by no intent of their own, they set the person up for a relapse. So it's really important that you have the time to educate the family. And we simply don't have the bandwidth to do that yet. But I, yeah, it is extremely important. Yes? Okay, I have two questions. One, when you say licensed clinicians, are there mostly LCDCs or LPCs? LCDCs. Okay. Um, number two, yeah. are you working with the private mental health hospitals yet? Because I know a lot of them, if there a lot of people that go in don't have a place to go afterwards, but they have Medicare, Medicaid, so they can yeah. go to the private ones. Yeah. Not at this time, okay? It may be something that we will, we will um, uh, get to later, but quite often, if they have a pale source, then there's a host of resources out there to serve them. The target population for us is people that are uninsured or underinsured, okay? Um, the, that population that you basically that you see on the street, that population that matched the profile that I showed you. What I didn't have in that data was how many of those individuals that do not have, um, that do not have resources, okay? Uninsured or underinsured. And that is primarily our target population. Yeah, it's easy to get help for an individual that's got a, a payer, whether it's private or, or, or um, Medicaid or Medicare. Any other questions? Yes. Are you looking for what kind of 
people are you looking for to help you out as far as to be part of your army, as you said? <laughs> yes. Yes. People who are motivated to, uh, to, to serve this mission. Yeah. People who, yeah. People who are motivated to serve this mission. Uh, because we do. We need the whole community. One, we need the community informed. We need the community informed about the prevalence of addiction. We need the community informed about um, the level of substance use, uh, even something as uh, accepted in our culture as, as drinking. Uh, the, the, the need to understand what limits are, safe limits are around drinking, so that they do not put themselves and the rest of, the, rest of us in harm's way uh, as, they, as they do this. And you know, this is not. We're not an organization that, ab that advocate total abstinence from alcohol for people who are old enough to drink. Uh, but we do advocate being responsible. Yes. Questions? Yes. yes. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kincaid, thank you again for the presentation. Um, my question is based on on your observations of that San Antonio event, do you think, I know we had rumors and talks about Houston having an outdoor open area for the homeless. What are we looking at on that? Is it, is it those talks have cut down or could it be beneficial for Houston to have something like that? I think it would be beneficial for Houston to have some place that they can send people to when they force them to move from where they are. Like yesterday. Yeah. Like yesterday. Okay. Um, the history of that is that the city passed the ordinance a few years ago that allowed them to uh, be able to have people move, but they got sued. They got sued because they didn't have a place to, for them to go to. Okay, and so they're still dealing with that. So um, they can, you know, they can cause people to move. Well, that's really the, uh, um, the highway people. Um, text that, okay? It's that, it, it's that group um, that can say, okay, this property, the property that these bridges are over belong to them. So they can, they can, they can set rules about what that under space is used for, okay? And so what's allowing them to take the action that they're being able to take right now is that text that is saying, okay, okay, we want to move these people from under this area. Um, and so the city is still with this same kind of catch-22. Uh, they've got this. They've got this. This ordinance passed, but they can't really enforce it because they don't have this place that when they say you got to move from here, they got to say you got to move from here to where, okay, and provide that place. So the whole idea of creating this outdoor shelter was about that place. You can move from here, but it, we, can, we can cause you to move from here because we can cause you, because we provided a place for you to go. Now, it's up to you whether you choose to go because it's all voluntary, but you can't stay here. And they could enforce that if they had a place for them to go. So to answer your question, yes, that issue is still very much alive. Where it is, I don't know, because every plan that they came up with so far um, didn't, didn't go through. Yes. I want to clarify something. So when we're thinking about a place for people to go, are we thinking about something like what San Antonio has with the Haven of Hope where there's wraparound care services, something to do, or are we just looking for a place to be like they're under the freeway? So I don't know. Okay. I know that... Um, the city asked me for a proposal about a year ago, and what I gave them was a proposal that included a lot of the things that San Antonio has. Okay, and um, um, they changed their mind about that uh, proposal, but I don't know if it had anything to do with uh, the, the service model that I was proposing. So to answer that question, I don't know. I don't think that they're obligated to, to have wraparound services. Um, I think that they see the value in having wraparound services for this population because I think one of the goals that they want to achieve, excuse me, at the end of the day is to have as many of these people's houses as they possibly could. Okay, and that's a process for some of these people. That is a process. Um, and, you know, 
some of these people actually resist being housed. Uh, they simply don't. And believe it or not, because this is something that we discovered with the population that we work with. Some of these individuals, when you get them in a house, and that's a process. You know, it's taken us a year to get some people housed that had a house. Okay? And then once we got them housed, they wouldn't stay. Okay, you got, and you would think that, oh, God, you got a house, you got roof over your head, you know, uh, uh, you're out of the elements, uh, and you're out of that crowd that, that uh, poses a threat. I mean, it's not easy living on the streets. It's dangerous out there. I mean, it's really dangerous. And so you would think that taking a person out of that element, they would welcome the opportunity. That is not the case. That is not the case. And part of it is, it's the psychology of it all. One is that they become so accustomed to living like that, that that is norm. Okay, and now we're talking about changing the norm for them. So things that you would think that they would be comfortable getting away from, they miss. Okay, they miss the people that they hang out with. They miss the blocks that they hang out on. One of the things that we've seen happen repeatedly is that we take a person, we put them in a house. They may spend a night at the house, but they spend a day on the block um, uh, where, they, where, where they're out there with the rest of their friends. Now, they may go home at night, but they get up the next day, they go back out on the block. And they go, and if they're panhandling, they'll go out and they'll do that because panhandling is a fairly decent hustle, believe it or not. Uh, <clears throat> some people can predict the amount of money that they're going to make. Um, and, you know, we had this one, and this population has really educated us. I mean, they have taken me to school in terms of what, what they value and my perception of what is a benefit to them. So um, we had this one person that we were trying to get a job, and um, she basically said, uh, uh, why would I work for that when I can make twice that doing this? And all she was doing was panhandling. Was panhandling, standing on a corner. This corner, this corner produced this much revenue. This corner. Now, I'm not moving to that corner. It doesn't produce as much revenue. It's this corner. So it's, you know, it's, it's not easy. You really do have to get into that psychology. You have to understand what motivates them. You have to understand what, what has value to them. And then how do you begin to introduce that value in a way that offsets that motivation? And that's your compassion, I think. Yes, I, yes, yes. <laughs> We're committed to giving them, giving them a chance. At the end of the day, it's their choice. But we as a community can assume responsibility for giving them a chance. Yeah, um, I think um, that when you work in, like, like you do with the homeless community, um, I think it boils down to the assessment, and it is going to take a big team of people to figure out, to assess all of those people and figure out what all of them need. Uh, I've worked with the homeless population. Um, I'm a metro bus driver. Yeah. And before, they, before your place, they had a park over on McKee where all of them used to live. And they forced them out because they were going to build something there. They put them under the freeway, and then they blocked off the freeways so I think once you lose structure, then anything becomes comfortable, yeah. you know. And then a lot of them are veterans, yeah. but they real educated people. I mean, there's a lot of people under that is educated, and, and homelessness um, can strike any of us at any yeah. time because I don't know how many mortgages I can miss before I'm yeah. homeless, yep. you know. I call it situational homeless. Yeah. So um, I think when, when a lot of people look at them, they think that all of them are either drug users, a lot of them are mental, mentally ill. Yes. And in one of my psychology classes, um, we talked about how the prison systems in the mental hospitals once a year open the doors and give them a one-way ticket to anywhere in Texas and yeah. everybody choose Houston yes. down by Greyhound, yes. you know. So um, it's, it's an epidemic now. And then the Kush has come into play and they're all over by Willow Station, yeah. you know, so. But a lot of those people under those bridges get a check every month. Yes. And they buy those tents. And when they get on the bus and I ask them, I say, well, why won't you pay rent? Yeah. Why do they do that? You're right. Thank you. After a while, 
even the ones with, with the addictions, you know, um, addiction in addiction, uh, a lot of people stay in it because it's comfortable. Yeah. You don't have to be responsible for a whole lot of things, you know, and, and then you burn down bridges with, with family and, you know, you either under the freeway or in jail. Because that's what a revolving door comes in at. Yeah. So what would you say is your, on a day-to-day -day basis, what's your biggest challenge? Getting access to, to resources in a timely manner. Getting accesses, access to resources in a timely manner. Yes. These are individuals that are looking for help, being able to get them to the help that they need in a timely manner. Because the way our service model works is once you say you want help, then we assume responsibility for getting you placed in a, in a recovery-friendly environment. It may not be the most ideal, but it is one of those places that we trust, okay? And uh, say like you need detox. Uh, Sometimes a person, we've had people who were going into withdrawal in our facility. They know how, because they've been, uh, an, uh, say, a, an addicted person for a really long time, they know how to manage their withdrawal, okay? They just leave and go get something to drink and come back. Okay, and so we've had to deal with that um, repeatedly. It's just a part of the process that we deal with now, uh, especially with that population. If we can't get them into a safe and supportive recovery and friendly environment, especially with a with detox withdrawal, that um, um, they, they either have to get to care um, in, pretty, in a pretty short period of time or they have to self-medicate. And they know how to do that, and we understand that. And so. If they, want, if they need to go self-medicate, they can go self-medicate and they can come back and we'll take them. And we'll start that process over. Uh, but getting access to the appropriate care in a timely manner is the biggest challenge we face on a daily basis. And the greatest need we have in this community is detox, medically, medically supervised detox. So how can we as the College of Public Service help you, the Houston Recovery Center? I mean, do you do, you do internships where, where our students could uh, work in your center or things like that? We do internship for undergraduate and graduate level social workers, social work students. That is the only internship that we have right now. No CIs. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry? No CIs. No CIs. Yeah, yeah, we don't do CIs yet. Uh, yeah. Um, we are still putting some of the components of our care system in place, um, but to where, where we are right now is those are the only ones that we can manage. So it's undergraduate and graduate social work Social work students, yes. So if, a, if a student were, were studying criminal justice. Yes. How, how could this, hmm? And social work and And social, yeah, and social, social work and crime. Social work and crime, I love that, <laughs> yes. Uh, which is a lot of our students. Yes, yes. Um, how, is there a path for them at your place that they could do something? Not at this time. Um, probably more appropriate for um, HPD Mental Health Division, who's upstairs in our building. Okay, and what I really like about the HPD Mental Health Division is that they are not enforcement. They are both, they're more like social workers with guns. So, um, and I got that, that's not mine. I got that from a, from the, from a cop. Yeah. Social workers with guns. With guns. Okay. All right, then. Any, any other questions? Hmm? Okay. So, Mr. Kincaid, thank you so much. Can we give him a round of applause? Thank you, guys. I don't think many of us knew the extent of the problem or, or the extent of the solutions that you provide. Mm. Uh, and so we were really grateful that you came to us and, and you told us about this. Yeah. So thank you very much. We look forward to your growth so that we can send some of our students over to you. Oh, absolutely. So, but we would like to present you with this, um, this ah. framed uh, <laughs> yes. uh, advertisement of, of our session tonight with yeah. you right there in the middle ah. as, a, as an expression of our <laughs> thanks for having you come over. I wish you had told me this. I would have sent a better picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. And, and thank you. Really appreciate it.